good morning everyone uh, we have already discussed the first part of our hardware and software now uh, let us now continue with our hardware and software overview in this particular lecture we shall continue with the software details and uh, then we shall discuss the networking ideas uh, software concepts we had already seen that there are software such as the system software and the application software and there is a difference between the two. Now uh, specifically about application software uh, that is our focus area, certain important concepts are here. The uh, first one is the multiprogramming. Multiprogramming is a method of executing two or more programs concurrently using the same computer right multi uh, tasking is multi programming capability of primarily single user operating system such as those of pcs so usually what happens that uh, in uh, unix based system or even linux based system we have uh, multi terminals right so wherever there are multiple terminals uh, the idea is that a number of users are connected to the same server or the computer, uh, the uh, main computer and then uh, executing their programs, right. So this basically can be called as multiprogramming. So basically the multiprogramming idea is uh, connected with you know the multi-terminal concepts as well. However, uh, we have seen that today's uh, personal computers has the capability of multiprogramming in a single user operating system uh, even though you are using the same PC but you can fire more than one job you know you can have number of windows and in, in each window you can have uh, a different program running so this you can call as multitasking. Uh, Virtual storage is a way of handling programs more efficiently by the computers uh, by dividing the programs into small fixed or variable length portions with only a small portion stored in the primary memory at a time. So what happens when you have multitasking or multiprogramming naturally uh, the RAM you know even if you have a very big size RAM even then. Uh, if a large number of programs are running it may not be possible uh, in a most efficient manner to use the RAM by keeping everything loaded there all right so it is better that if we think of a concept of a virtual storage and uh, put some of those programs which are not currently running into the virtual storage so that is the basic idea uh, of the virtual storage then time sharing the time sharing idea is the sharing of the computer resources by many users simultaneously the by having the cpu spend a fixed amount of time on each users program before proceeding to the next so you see when we have a number of processors a number of uh, computers uh, programs running and uh, vying for the same computer resource naturally what will happen uh, you cannot uh, run all the programs at the same time right so you have to have a time sharing uh, method by which the uh, cpu spends a fixed amount of time on each users program so that gives us uh, brings us to the concept of multiprocessing an operating system feature for executing two or more instructions simultaneously in a single computer system by using multiple central processing units right so this is an operating system feature where uh, you are executing two or more instructions simultaneously by basically there are it's a kind of parallel processing then uh, we have the basic idea of the source code compiler and the object code source codes are the program instructions the program which you have written in the high level language and uh, it has to be translated to the machine language for execution by the computer and this particular translation is done by a compiler right so what does the compiler does it 
translates the source code into an object code. The object code therefore is the program instructions that have been translated into machine language for execution by the computer. Then we have the graphic user interface GUI. GUI is that part of the operating system that users interact with the uh, that uses graphic icons and the computer mouse to issue commands and make selections. So GUI uh, you know uh, contrast with CUI character user interface most of uh, today's modern computer systems are essentially G, uh, GUI based that is the graphic user interface based and uh, basic advantage of graphic user interface is that it is not necessary uh, like Unix to know a large number of commands. It is not uh, the command line interface. Uh, what is happening here is that you know you can uh, uh, click on icons and uh, uh, you know use a navigated uh, menu system and uh, therefore do your tasks without uh, really uh, you know knowing too much about the system. So very good for the novice users but for experienced users sometimes they feel the system is rather too slow right. So it is also important when you are giving a graphic user interfaces you should give shortcuts to uh, people who are already experienced. There are various kinds of PC operating systems such as the Windows 2000, Windows XP, uh, Linux, then Unix. Uh, they are primarily different on multi-user processing, multitasking, multiprocessing, networking and machine independence. See the machine independence is a very important thing. Most of the operating system you know they should uh, try to make a uh, situation, try to make a condition, precondition so that uh, the resulting operating system environment is independent of the machine hardware because you see there are uh, so many different configurations of computers that are actually possible. Uh, depending on what kind of machine configuration one is using, it is possible to have uh, you know various uh, different hardware configuration. Now if uh, your program will run only in uh, one computer and not in another there will be some hitches then it is not a very good thing to happen. The general users they should not be bothered about the nitty gritties of hardware. So all these basically the operating system should take care of. What the operating system should do? it should provide an machine independent environment to the user. That means if the operating system runs, the hardware is fine. You do not have to worry about the hardware at all. Now the operating system takes over. All right? So when we are writing our programs, uh, if the operating system is there, we should know that our program will run. Again, we need not bother that we have to put that hardware, we have to put that hardware. The operating system itself should prompt uh, to us on that level. Uh, then like the uh, generations of hardware, we also have the generations of programming languages. We have the first generation languages, second generation, third generation and also the fourth generation uh, programming languages. The first one is the first generation which is basically the machine language, machine languages in terms of zeros and ones. So essentially the machine languages are uh, uh, cannot be understood uh, by general people or anybody for that matter until unless uh, we try to obtain patterns in them. The second generation languages are called the assembly language. Uh, unlike you see we are not giving any years. It is not that the machine languages were first, assembly languages are next. It is really not that way. It is all the generation of languages are present uh, at the same time. Even today we have the assembly language, we have the machine language, we have the high level procedural languages and also the non-procedurals that the fourth generation languages. So all the generations of languages are present at a given point of time. It is only the level at which you are operating. All right. 
So if you are using first generation or second generation programming, most likely you are working at the hardware level, most likely you are writing system software. Uh, if you are using third generation and fourth generation languages, it is likely that you are using application software and you are uh, writing applications for specific organizational needs, right? So, uh, then you see the third generation languages are called procedurals because uh, these languages follow uh, procedure. Procedure in the sense that the programming instructions, there is a control flow logic, right? So, if you want uh, a matrix multiplication, you have to uh, understand that matrix multiplication can be possible only when you have uh, row wise and column wise, uh, you know, take the elements, multiply them, sum that up and put it as a, uh, in a third matrix, which is the multiplied matrix and put the values. Similarly, do for every element. So, the entire procedure has to be done with the help of uh, for or, uh, you know, some kind of while or some do while or do until some kind of looping construct has to be put and they have to be sequentially calculated one after the other. Only then the actual matrix multiplication uh, will take place. Uh, there is no other way uh, you can actually think of doing this if you are using a programming language such as a third generation language like Fortran, COBOL, BASIC or C uh, to uh, uh, do your particular task. The fourth generation languages are different. These are uh, called the non-procedural languages uh, or packages. Uh, these are like SQL, uh, MS Access, MS Excel, you know, these kind of software. Uh, basically, the fourth generation languages, the idea is that here uh, we are uh, using, uh, we are really not going into the nitty gritties how this will be done. A particular SQL statement like select star uh, from employee. It will show all the records from employee one after the other. If you have to write a program in any language, you have to basically write a procedural steps. Whereas the SQL, which is just a single line command, uh, this command is interpreted by database. So, you see, uh, the database has got the capability to understand SQL. Basically, it, it must have an SQL preprocessor, right? So, this is very important that a, a procedural language uh, has to be understood by the resulting uh, package in uh, which supports it. So, this actually, uh, it, it is like, you know, pre-compiled program available somewhere and you are just writing a single one or two line statements in a non-procedural manner. The advantages are tremendous. The, you do not have to write huge amount of code and lot of details, the nitty gritties are hidden from you. So, that is why the fourth generations are popular, but obviously they may not be possible to optimize uh, to that extent and uh, therefore, they may not be as quick as uh, the program executions. Some of the query languages like AQL, QBE or SQL, a structured query language itself. SQL has become a world standard query language uh, used in many platforms like DOS, Windows, Unix, Linux and many database management systems such as Oracle, Sybase, Informix and so on. So, we have now SQL like a world standard and we can use SQL almost anywhere. So, SQL is a very important component of a database system. Every time you write, uh, uh, um, you know, you want to do very simple processing with a database, you can make use of SQLs. Then we have uh, fourth generation languages apart from SQL, we have different types of report generators and the graphic languages. The report generators are software that create customized report in a wide range of formats that are not, not routinely produced by an uh, information system. So, basically what is happening in a report generator, it is like a program which uh, when executes gives you 
a particular report right so it's like a report generator see advantage here is that again you see every report generator generates a program so you are just writing uh, certain or selecting from menu uh, certain preconditions and uh, using those preconditions uh, specifying the variables or specifying the database from which the report is to be generated uh, you can actually create the particular report graphic languages these are software that displays the data from database files in the graphic formats then uh, all important geographical information systems geographical information systems are basically software that maps any data that has a special quality so uh, basically you know the advantages of gis uh, is in uh, sometimes you know categorizing the data on a geographical basis so some examples like to depict the service reach of a company to display the customers on a map and design the most efficient delivery routes to display and analyze customer data by store location and to track the competition so you know you know uh, there could be uh, various possibilities uh, for example let's take a simple example of a gis say uh, we have uh, the data of uh, you know the various patients in a given area now uh, we come to uh, by a preliminary analysis we find that all these uh, all these patients are uh, really suffering from malaria now any amount of uh, data analysis if you do probably nothing more could be revealed all that you basically get that uh, there are various patients in a given area and the malaria is the predominant cause so that's what we find that uh, malaria is a predominant cause uh, now if you do a geographical analysis suppose uh, this is the geographical area in which these patients are uh, see in this geographical area if you plot the patients that means the houses of the patients so you can see so these dots are basically houses of the patients who are having malaria now you see uh, a very peculiar pattern that this is the point where the patients are actually clustered so that means out of the total locality this is the complete locality then this is the area where most of the malaria patients are coming from all right and uh, if you really analyze you may see that uh, in this area we have ponds and uh, generally the mosquitoes there is a huge growth of mosquitoes so immediately we know that we have to have a very special attention on this particular area right so this analysis is possible because of gis all right so it is basically the basic uh, focus area of gis is that uh, we we can actually uh, we can actually find out uh, the advantages of geographically clustering uh, the data right which is uh, usually not done uh, in uh, normal database analysis right so you can see that you can find out the service reach 
you can uh, find out the delivery routes, you can uh, uh, display the customer database store like a location. So, now even the transport now with the uh, advantages of mobile technology, it is also possible to track down, track down the suppliers, track down the supply event. So, maybe uh, you see that uh, we may we may find a situation where uh, our uh, trucks are coming from very um, uh, you know far off locations and we can actually track them that where are our supplies at a given point of time. Uh, then there are various kinds of other software like word processing software, the spreadsheets, the data management software, integrated software packages, web browsers. So, these are all uh, important other uh, tools which are uh, very much useful in the personal computing environment. Then a very important concept of uh, object oriented programming. Object oriented programming is an approach to software development that combines data and procedures into a single object. See the basic advantages of uh, these object oriented programming uh, is that uh, since we use the so called classes which are object oriented features so that all objects belonging to a certain class has all the features of that class, we can have the facility of inheritance. Uh, see basically the advantages of inheritance is that or the idea of inheritance is that suppose we have say uh, various types of say uh, we have the various types of say we can call vehicles, see uh, vehicles. Now, we can see that we have the two wheelers and we have the four wheelers. Then within the two wheelers again, we have different kinds of scooters, motorcycles and four wheelers also, we have cars, buses, trucks and so on. Now, uh, interesting thing here is that so we can call it an inheritance tree. Now, the advantages that we get is that, uh, see there are certain properties which are always true for irrespective of whether it is a scooter or motorcycle, cars or buses, it is a vehicle. Because it is a vehicle, it has to have a license plate, it has to have a registration number, right? It has to have an owner and it has to have a license. So, you see those kind of properties can be grouped together and put it under a generalized class called vehicles. Then there are certain properties peculiar to two wheelers alone or general properties of four wheelers alone. They can be put here and they can be put here. And then specific properties can be actually there in the cars or buses. So, by so doing <coughs> what we are able to do is uh, we are able to classify, first of all we get a classification and uh, not only that, we are able to uh, allocate the most general tasks to a super class like vehicle or two wheeler with regard to scooter and motorcycle and keep only the very uh, specific properties to the subclasses, right. So, it is not necessary to generate the redundancy can be reduced to a great extent. Uh, not only that, not only apart from redundancy, the general routine can be actually the it therefore helps in what is known as reuse. You know, you can you can uh, have the generalized features because you are able to do generalized class libraries. These class libraries can be used later on. And this is where the another advantage of object oriented and uh, programming comes that uh, object oriented programming does what is known as encapsulation. 
encapsulation see the idea of encapsulation is that encapsulation so every object has got uh, certain data and methods and uh, these data and methods are basically encapsulated inside the object boundary and uh, really one cannot change those data and the methods and uh, they can only come by uh, through a message passing so in that sense every object has a boundary uh, which you cannot cross so therefore it is also good that you cannot change an object just like that because you cannot change the object define the object in the most generalized manner and use them again in a different application all right so the entire application package which you are using in the object oriented uh, software we have developed many parts of it can actually be made use of in another context so that is the basic advantage of uh, uh, this kind of software development so that's why we see that uh, the object oriented programming has become so popular essentially because of code reuse essentially because of encapsulation essentially because uh, also that is the way we think because if you really see the education process right from the childhood a child is uh, basically associates the world with objects with their behavior the behavior of the objects and the classification of the objects right so that's that's the basic advantages of object oriented programming then also we have uh, what is known as visual programming visual programming is the construction of software program by selecting and arranging programming objects rather than by writing program code see uh, advantage that comes uh, out of the visual programming is that uh, we have when you are doing visual programming since we have already defined well defined icons well defined objects so the entire software that you want to develop they can be the you know putting together it is like the modules are given you you arrange the modules together and uh, decide what you want to do all right so if you have to uh, if uh, you have been given all parts of the uh, you know small modules and you you have to uh, choose your modules and build your thing so that is the idea of visual programming definitely it makes things easier and uh, uh, it, it, i mean uh, it is difficult you know sometimes it is difficult to the people who have already learned a different technique but to a person who is new for him it will appear that much simpler let us now discuss a very important issue with regard to software that is the so called java revolution the java is an object oriented programming language that can deliver only the software functionality needed uh, for a particular task as a small applet downloaded from a network can run on any computer and operating system so the most important uh, uh, thing about java is the platform independence right so what is uh, you can let us see what is the basic advantages of java this is the hardware and software independence reduced program size and easy distribution of software now uh, i think uh, without java the internet wouldn't have been uh, this much popular as it has been uh, today so uh, how it is happening uh, basically you see that uh, if you want to write everything think of suppose uh, some hundred people or even thousands and uh, why hundred thousands of people they all are coming to your website and uh, basically trying to obtain information out of it what will happen invariably what will happen uh, the your system will be cluttered and the processing speed will be extremely slow right because all thousand programs are trying to run in your computer and your computer cannot run so many computers so many programs and we have seen that even 20 30 programs if it runs in one computer it becomes quite slow what will happen if thousands or even more programs start running in your program 
So, there should be some efficient way uh, it has to be done and that is what is accomplished with the help of Java. The old day software runs on specific hardware and operating system for which it was written. Java promises platform independent applications running on any computer and operating system. So, how Java has done this? Uh, basically, Java done, uh, Java whenever you write a Java program uh, or whenever you uh, write, load a Java, uh, basically it creates what is known as a Java virtual machine, JVM. So, basic idea of the Java virtual machine is creates a given environment over and above the particular uh, uh, operating system on which you are operating. So, you may be operating Linux or you may be operating Windows 2000, Windows NT or Windows XP or any other uh, software platform. Uh, basically, if uh, you have now an equivalent, you know, the similar kind of uh, system working, then uh, the Java code can also run in that particular environment. So, suppose you are in Windows 2000 with JVM, Windows NT with JVM, Linux with JVM, Unix with JVM, they all should uh, give a similar platform to the Java application which is, uh, which you are downloading and since you are downloading that, it will simply run equally irrespective of the platform. That is the basic advantage. Then program size. Old day software has uh, giant applications with more functionality than needed and which require large powerful computers to run. Whereas Java has small applets which delivers only the functionality needed and which run on small computers and handheld device. So, you see the basic idea in Java is that the size is uh, tremendously small, it is so small and basically when you are going to another computer all that is you are doing, you are just taking away or uh, downloading a Java program to your machine. So, actually uh, when 1000 programs are coming to a particular website, the 1000 programs are not running in that computer where the website is hosted. The actually, the computer program is running in the client's own computer. So, if you are downloading something, you are, if you are you are basically running the program in your computer, not in that computer. So, that is the basic difference. How, how, where did you get the program? The program you are simply downloaded. So, all that the server is doing, server is giving you a computer program, that is the Java applet. Alright, since that is how uh, the whole thing works, the, even with uh, 1000 uh, users, the uh, web server can still give you information and does not become inordinately slow. Then the software distribution. In the old day software, we have the vast costly distribution chain including packaging, wholesalers, retailers, advertising and catalog companies with users needing to upgrade every two years. Whereas the Java, the distribution chain eliminated, software comes to desktop from network as needed with latest upgrade. So, that is the another advantage of Java. So, management and organizational benefits, companies need not buy hundreds of thousands of copies of the software to run on individual computers, they may buy just one network copy, payment mode now may be for each usage. Company need not buy powerful PCs for its employees, alright. So, companies will have less need to set IT standards, all devices including cellular phones or TV sets can run Java applets. Companies will have better control over both data and software, upgrade is required in only one place, that is at the network computer. Now, another very important concept that of electronic data interchange, uh, EDI. See, direct computer to computer exchange between two organizations of standard business transaction documents. Uh, basic idea of EDI, let us try to understand. You see, suppose this is one company, this is another company. So, this is the, let us say, supplier company 
and this is the customer company. So we have the customer and we have the supplier. Now you see whenever the customer is purchasing something, customer gives a purchase order. Purchase order. Supplier sends the material along with an invoice and a delivery advice. Then it also gives a bill and customer finally make payments. So, uh, so customer has to uh, make a purchase order, print it, process, print it, give it to supplier. Now, supplier may be following a computer system where the purchase because you see the supplier is dealing with many customers and many customers are giving many different kind of purchase orders. So, supplier has to come to make them in a standard form, enter into the computer and prepare invoice. All right. After the invoice is prepared, the customer gets it. Now, customer is getting many different kinds of invoices from various suppliers, put it in the appropriate form and make it ready. Then again supplier sends the bill and this bill may be again customer has to make it in a uh, equivalent form and put it and then process and make payments. Again when supplier gets the payments, they have to again make their own processing. So in this entire process of interaction between the customer and supplier, for each customer supplier pair, uh, you see. The, there is a lot of time that goes in preparation of purchase order, invoice, uh, bill, payment, delivery advice, not only at the customer end, but also at the supplier end. So, if customer has made all these uh, preparations, all these uh, work for the purchase order preparation, why should supplier again resolve it? That is where electronic data interchange comes in. What the electronic data interchange does, what the electronic data interchange does that it basically uh, is a third party interchange which sets certain standards. So, the standard says if it is a purchase order, it has to be like this. If it is an invoice, it has to be like this. If it is a bill, it has to be like this. So, once these standards are set, then the uh, supplier company and the your uh, customer company, they have to uh, conform and if they conform through computer like an uh, you know the purchase order can be sent and since both the computer companies are using similar computer uh, um, what do you call uh, standards, then the purchase order is accepted uh, by the computer as it is, no change is required, no processing is required and the invoice can be immediately generated and sent to the com uh, parent company, the customer. So the processing is reduced by at least half, alright. Uh, you do not have to again make uh, extra efforts to put the customer's PO into your computer and since the exchange is happening in an electronic manner, all the transport delays are cut. Tremendous time is uh, saved in terms of, you know, uh, cutting down the delays of transportation and pre-processing of purchase order, invoice, bills, payment details, etc. So, that is the basic idea of electronic data interchange and it is a very popular uh, thing uh, as a very important part of a company's uh, ERP. So, what can be transmitted or received? Material releases, price updates shipping notices, discrepancy reports, payment or remittance details. What is required? Transaction standardization, transaction software, appropriate mailbox facilities, means to satisfy legal restrictions, right. So, these are uh, quite important uh, for an electronic data interchange to be successful. Uh, now, uh, let us try to go and uh, check uh, the various data communication details. Data communication entails electronically exchanging data or information, that is the primary goal 
of any data communication. So first and foremost we must differentiate between analog signals and digital signals. Analog signals are continuous waves that carry information by altering the characteristics of the waves. Digital signals are discrete on-off pulses that convey information in terms of zeros and ones. Digital signals are advantage. Why it is advantageous? Let us see that. Digital signals tend to get less affected by interference or noise. Digital signals can be strengthened repeatedly for long distances without accumulating noise. Digital signals among computers requires no conversion from digital to analog to digital, whereas analog uh, signals require it. Basically, the biggest advantage of digital signals is that uh, it doesn't accumulate noise. Why? Because it is in terms of zeros and ones. So, if there is a noise, then by using certain methods like parity bits or any other method, you can actually correct it. So, that is the biggest advantage, but analog signals will uh, always they are you know affected by interference and they are accumulate noises. <coughs> Another very important thing, the cables, there are various kinds of cables that are important for uh, data transfer or communication. The old ones were twisted pair cables, most prevalent relatively inexpensive, widely available, but subject to interference and can be tapped easily. Because of copper cables, fire hazards also exist. Coaxial cables, these are metallic cables, much less susceptible to interference, can carry more data, can carry high speed data traffic and TV signals, more expensive, difficult to work with, relatively inflexible, cost of connecting can overshoot the cost of data communication. There are some difficulties with coaxial cables as well. Then the recent trend is fiber optic cables, thousands of very thin filaments of glass fibers that can conduct light pulses generated by lasers at transmission frequencies approaching the speed of light, right? provide significant size and weight reductions, increase speed, greater data carrying capacity and greater security from interference and tapping. But some difficulties because cost of fiber, obviously it has come down in recent years, installing cable, uh, then joining fiber optic cables with little or no loss of signals. These are difficult. These are so usually whenever we talk of fiber optic cables, we want fiber optic cables for kilometers together, something like 100 kilometers long fiber optic cables without any joints, right. So, some difficulties are there, but even then because the very fact that they are so simple to operate and so lightweight and uh, uh, so much of speed, uh, they have become more or less the world standard today. Wireless communications and mobile computing, transmissions that send signals to air or space without any physical wires or cables. So, some of these like microwave, satellite, low orbit satellites, paging systems, cellular telephones, mobile data networks, personal communication services, personal digital assistance. So, there are various wireless communication systems that have come and uh, they have become very important today in today's communication systems. Some of the communication channel details, a like transmission speed is uh, measured in terms of bits per second, BPS, concept of baud rate, a baud rate is a change in signal from positive to negative or vice versa. At higher speeds, a single signal change rate can transmit more than one bit at a time. That bit rate sometimes exceeds baud rate, alright. So, whereas the transmission speed is bits per second, the baud rate is a change in signal from positive to negative, alright. So, how much it is changing that is basically a uh, baud rate. Then the concept of bandwidth, the bandwidth is capacity of communication channel as measured by the difference between the highest and lowest frequencies that can be transmitted by the channel. So, 
what are the range of frequencies which can actually be transmitted bigger it is bigger is the bandwidth so it is the range of frequencies and uh, we always want high bandwidth for higher data transmission so we can we have something like twisted wire uh, microwave satellite coaxial cable fiber optic cable as we can see that fiber optic cable uh, the speed is uh, the bandwidth could be very very high all right so it could be as high as 10 gbps then there are transmission modes the transmission mode can be asynchronous or synchronous asynchronous which is like a start stop transmission one character at a time a start beat one character one or two stop beats and a parity beat but these are possible only for uh, low speed transmission synchronous high speed simultaneous transmission of large blocks of data all right it is not a start stop transmission it is a continuous stream of data that are going so it is a called synchronous transmission modes then the difference between simplex half duplex and full duplex transmission simplex data can travel at one direction at all times half duplex transmission data can flow two ways but can travel only in one direction at a time full duplex transmission is only those where data can be sent in both directions simultaneously so that is another thing that whether it is simplex half duplex or full duplex then uh, there are various kinds of communication processors which are usually used uh, whenever we are having data communication needs hardware that supports data transmission and reception in a telecommunication network front end processor small computers managing communications for the host computer in a network a concentrator telecommunications computer that collects and temporarily stores messages from terminals for batch transmission to the host computer so these are the concentrators are basically uh, you know they are collectors which are uh, temporarily storing messages from terminals to the host computers then there are controllers which are specialized computer that supervises communication traffic between cpu and the peripheral devices in a telecommunication system and the multiplexer which is a device that enables a single communication channel to carry data transmissions from multiple sources simultaneously so these are different communication processors that are uh, present then we have various network topologies like the star or the bus the star network network topology where uh, all are connected to a host computer as if in a star the host computer is in the middle and all the other computers they are radiating from the host computers so here the disadvantage you can easily see that all communications must pass through the host computer so by any chance if the host computer goes out then uh, entire network thing will be also out right uh, <clears throat> the bus network the bus network is a network topology uh, that links a number of computers by a single circuit with all messages broadcast to the entire network there is no central host and messages can travel in both directions along the cable right so basically the messages are broadcast to the entire network and uh, since it is a network type of thing what can happen since if there are redundancies even if one or two uh, computers fail the network may still be working then we have the ring network it is a network topology in which all computers are linked by a closed loop in a manner that passes uh, data in one direction from one computer to another each computer operates independently so that if one fails communication through the network is not interrupted then we have various classifications like private bus exchange which is like a switching system we have a local area network 
that requires its own dedicated channels and encompasses a limited distance, usually one building or a number of buildings in close proximity. Uh, local area network requires a file server, a network operating system and a gateway. Uh, then uh, we have wide area network, telecommunications network that spans a large geographical distance, may consist of a variety of cables, satellites and microwave technology. We have value added network which is private, multipath, data only, third party managed network that are used by multiple organizations. Uh, finally, the telecommunications competitive advantage. The organizational use of telecommunications for competitive advantage. For communication, coordination and speeding of flow of transactions, message and information throughout business farms. So that is very important. Uh, what are the things we have? The electronic mail, the voice mail, the fax machines, digital information services, teleconferencing, data conferencing, video conferencing, EDI. We also have certain very important implementation factors like distance, range of services, security, multiple access, utilization, cost, installation and connectivity. So these are uh, some of the important implementation factors for a strategic telecommunication plan. So thank you very much.